Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Schramm. I'm the Interim Lunch Poems Coordinator. Thank you for being here with us today. First off, I'd like to invite you to, if you haven't already, uh, sign up for our email list. There's a sheet on the librarian's desk right over there, so please feel free to do that. Um, you're also welcome to check out our website, which is www.lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, and that has our complete lineup, as well as recordings of uh, past readings. Um, on March 3rd, um, we invite you to join us for a reading by poet David Winter, who is the author of In the Belly, The Sleep of Reason, and Warbird. Additionally, you're also invited to check out our Story Hour sister program. On February 11th at 5 p.m., there will be a reading by novelist Anthony Mara. Uh, now please welcome Robert Haas, director of Lunch Poems, who will introduce today's guest. Um, thank you, Katie. Welcome to this semester's round of Lunch Poems. Particularly happy today to introduce Judy Selebsky. Where are you, Judy? Selebsky, <laughs> there you are, right in, right in front of me who is a wonderfully fresh, smart, and inventive poet. I don't know what you're going to read today, but she's an absolute pleasure to read. She's the author of, I should back up and say, she was born in Nova Scotia. She, crucial to her aesthetic and to her development, she spent five years in Japan studying No and studying Buto, the Japanese dance form. Uh, that partly informs her poetics. She's a professor of English and creative writing at Dominican University in San Rafael. And she's just a terrific poet. Um, you find out wonderful things in her poems. For example, the fact that in Portuguese there is a specific verb for throwing things out a window. Are you going to read that poem today? Were you planning to? OK. Well, I won't tell all the other things you find out that way. Um, her first book w was called um, Sky Equals Empty. Uh, it was published by New Issues Press. Uh, it was chosen for that press series by the poet Marvin Bell, who said about it, this is so accurate to my experience, I wanted to read it. I was caught by the clarity of mind and expression of sky equals empty, a quality distinctive at any time. I was caught by the ear and the eye, the tone of voice, and, and the uh, easy movement between inner and outer worlds in these poems. After sky equals empty, uh, she published a chapbook, uh, also prize-winning, called Space Gap Interval Distance. And then she collaborated on a play about Emmett Till. Maybe there are some young people here who don't know who Emmett Till is. He was one of the focuses of the history of race in America in the 20th century, a young black kid from Chicago who went south to visit family made a wrong move in a southern town, was brutally beaten and murdered. Um, his his uh, family uh, took, well, his body was taken to the uh, mortuary in Tutwiler, Mississippi, where W.C. Handy first heard the first blues lyric uh, and wrote it down. Body shipped back to Chicago to his mother, it was an awful shape, and she demanded that there be an open casket. And the Chicago Defender took photographs of that brutalized body. And uh, this was 19, what year? 48, 50? It, it, it's, it's the moment that really initiated the civil rights movement, um, the moment before Rosa Parks sat down on that bus. She and collaborators did an astonishing play. It was only had a two week run, breathtaking play in the style of no theater on, on that event. It's really a major act of imagination. Her newest book is called Tree Line. It's uh, environmental uh, in its concerns. Uh, again, I want to quote a critic, Dean Rader, who said, Robert Frost believed a poem should begin in delight and end in wisdom, but in Tree Line, Judy Halepsky proves a poet never has to choose between the two. Her poems begin in both, and in, uh, end in both. They're smart, sexy, thoughtful, and beautiful. Her lyrics are a masterful 
marriage of language, of tradition and innovation. Uh, the book loves many things, language and landscape to be sure, but most of all, it loves this world and how we make our way in it. Please welcome Judy Halepsky. Hello. Bob, thank you for that just really very generous introduction. It was so sweet. And um, I'm really honored to be here at Lunch Poems. Uh, if you don't have a seat yet, don't be shy about coming in. Um, I have a plan. <laughs> um, I told Katie last time I was here, I came on a reconnaissance mission to see what to expect, and I told her I promised that today I would arrive having bathed, and I would be on time, and I would be sober. <laughs> and she said, yeah, the, the sober thing, not so much. So I'll start today with a poem from uh, Treeline. I, um, my first book is Sky Equals Empty, and it has a lot of um, family themes in it in a certain way. And in Treeline, I turn more to the earth and more to kind of poetic lineage. And this first poem is um, that, kind, that, that turn. It's called Transmission. From the darkness and the fireflies he calls me, Mapless, unguided night walker, pulling night from clear blue day to that heavy blue, when there's still a little light in the sky and the trees are dark against it. I am hiding in those trees, on a branch in the sway with the wind, not holding on so much as balancing. He calls me the night traveler, the angel breather, he calls me the one who has not come home. So I lived in Japan for a number of years. And more recently, I made a trip back there to um, follow where Basho went in his notebook, Okunoho Soimichi, the narrow road to the interior. And uh, when Basho went on this journey, he went with a Sora, his friend Sora, and they traveled together. And one of uh, Basho's haiku is kind of about um, parting ways with Sora. And one of the things that um, these travelers did is they kind of put on monks' robes and they wrote this passage on their on their walking staff or maybe on their hat that would say, "We go on this path two together." And um, that was, you would do that when you were going on a religious pilgrimage, and it would kind of mean, I'm not alone, I'm walking with the teachings of the Dharma. Um, but for Basho, he was walking with Sora. And so this poem is kind of in conversation with that little haiku. Walk the line. Bend the spine of a thesaurus, my shadow map, guide of distances, atlas of cities. If this book were a bridge, I would trust my weight to it. Late bloomer, mountain azalea, dwarf pine. The letters didn't always make words. There were years and years when they just stayed letters. I have come to feel the moss underwater. I have come to put my feet in the creek. Basho and Sora on pilgrimage, right on their hats. No home in heaven or earth. On this path, we go two together. Monks on pilgrimage, by two we go. The monk alone, but with the Dharma. Basho alone, but with Sora. Me in the library with 20,000 other fools. And a mother who wants a postcard, a line on a Christmas note, a baby girl to walk, a two-wheel bicycle, a spelling bee, a pirouette, a finger to trace the letters across the page. The letters to make a song. Some say they fought. Some say they parted in anger. 
After Sora stayed behind, Basho let the words, by two we go, wash off his hat in the rain. At graduation, my mother, hands in the air, shouts, it's a miracle, a miracle. <laughs> It's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces here. Thank you all so much uh, for coming. I um, moved here from Nova Scotia to study poetry at Mills College, and I studied with Hannah Block. And um, to move to the Bay Area from Nova Scotia was a major trauma. Uh, I had been in a one stoplight town in New Brunswick uh, beforehand. Um, but my professor, it was wonderful to study with Hannah, and she brought us on campus to UC Berkeley to hear Yehuda Amahai read. And I wrote a poem about that night, and I thought, since I'm here, I would read it. It's called, Sitting Beside Adrian Rich at the Yehuda Amahai Reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, in keeping with the kind of lineage of this book, um, I wrote this just after Adrian Rich had passed away. I remember the years without poems, silenced by marriage that you swam back from. Some wreck, some daughter-in-law, the poems dense and tightly sealed. At 22, I could barely open them. On the way to the reading, Hannah's talking about Amahai's new book. He won't let it out of his hands, she says. It's as if he thinks it's his last. Amahai reading in Hebrew, Hannah reading her translation. White underwear hanging on a clothesline under the blue Jerusalem sky. A man asks Hannah, but the blue and the white is the flag of Israel. Where's that image? She holds up her hands, widening the space of nothing but air between her fingers and her palms, as if to say, this is how much we hold. I sat beside you that night, hearing the same poems, breathing the same air. I introduced myself to you as if to a stranger, as if we had never met. They say in Iraq, we don't know which way to swim. They say to follow air bubbles to the surface. I was not cutting cake in a white dress, I was not kept in any house or any room. Shoes, eyeliner, the hold of his hands, the hull of a sunken ship, the metal cask, the vining sea kelp. We breathe oxygen at any depth. We must come up in stages so our bodies can reorient. All this takes time, years, the skin on my hands ages. Anchor, sea wind, north wind, I list with the current. It was his last book. I only thought the woman beside me was Adrian Rich. I shook her hand, and she was flattered. She liked the idea. another on-campus poem. Um, it's called Dark Matter, Pine Trees, Eternity, Room 205. Like a handmade ceramic bowl, uneven, oblong, dripped barren spots, Joshua departs for the army at dawn. Birds fly south and return months later. By then, they are different birds. It's not that they change. It's that the distance is longer than any one life. My job asks me to teach the history of the earth with both science and the idea that there's a greater purpose. So students don't get depressed or have a crisis when they learn that the sun is a star that will burn out, that death is part of what defines an organism as alive. At boot camp, they pound their teachings into him, how to fold sheets into squares, how to dream in black and white, Birds know the routes to nesting places. They know how to cross the ocean. 
Joshua, be like water. Change shapes, float. Let sticks, discarded carburetors, broken glass drift past you. First thing, they cut his hair, put him in uniform, take his picture. He looks like a soldier already, Eve says. Joshua, dug from the foothills, built by hand. A student comes to me with her palm out, holding a green cone-shaped seed. From this, she says, a redwood tree. Isn't that amazing? Okay, I have a question I'm sure this crowd knows the answer to. Bob Hass, you can't comment. You better wait a minute. Um, what's Basho's most famous haiku? Frog in water. Yeah, the frog haiku. Right, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. The frog jumping into the pond. So I have my own poem written from the many challenges of poets trying to translate that haiku. So the haiku is a little bit in here, and um, also some of our, our, our well-known poets are also quoted in here. It's called a breaking word, which is like a haiku structure. That's one of the things that makes it really hard to translate haiku, because they have words that don't mean anything. So, <laughs> Okay, a breaking word. There's that part after Basho writes, old, still pond, a pressing a fingerprint into wet clay, where the word ya holds a space in the air, a cloud changes shape in the sky. Make it a dash, a murmur, a breath on the inhale. This old pond, so many have tried to open. A sigh, a hum, a frog jumps in. Sound of water, says Haas. Plop, says Watts. Kerplunk, says Ginsburg. <laughs> One of the things that brought me to California is that my father loves Berkeley as a concept, as a place. Um, and recently, um, I was at an event at La Pena that made me think of him. So I want to read a poem for him today. And this poem is called Making Sure. Dad calls and asks, how goes the struggle? He means advanced composition, the revolution, dreams that floated past him in the gray, fraying winters of Halifax. At La Pena, they are cheering the release of two men from prison. There are those who couldn't be here tonight, those who are here only in spirit. Barrel hitch, timber hitch, blood, lot, blood knot to mend a broken line. The Cuban five are free and back in Havana. My father is with them in his seafaring apartment where he comes in and out with brine and a rusted anchor, no one to cut the rigging. When a stranger comes to the door, I don't answer. It's either a neighbor or a church lady come to tell me that I can believe in science and still be a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> Opiate of the masses, cool my blood, numb my heart, Lift me from here, alpine butterfly, bowline, water knot, clove hitch. I carry bags home from the store. I sit out on the porch, listen to his voice on the answering machine. He says, you are never home. Hey. Um, so I did study Butoh for a long time, well, on and off. And um, 
I love training in Bhutto dance. I think it's a, a, a dance form very close to poetry and somehow really like free improvisation um, and that kind of aesthetic challenge of free improvisation in dance um, is somehow related to what we might be doing in free verse poetry. So um, going to those dance classes was often an impetus for poems for me. Um, so Kazo Ono started Buto dance in the 60s as kind of a post-war form influenced by German Expressionism. And he um, taught dance till he was 100 or more. And so I started training at his studio when he was still teaching in the studio. And, and as I trained there, his son um, took over the classes. So this poem is called Ono Studio. When he couldn't walk, he would sit and dance with his hands dashing like birds. Now at over 100, he is sleeping in the house next door. We take off our shoes and stretch. His son writes the characters, snow, flower, moon. Some die like snow, he says. It's beautiful at dusk, and then the next day, where's the snow? Or a flower blooming all in one season. Or the moon, little by little, waning. After floating his hands in the air above his head, angling them out in jagged lines, ball, balls of raw silk, a snail in a shell, he started to cry. Not a little bit, but tears streaking down his cheeks. Window frames, rooftops, fences and fields, bony hips, knobby knees, the dancing Antonio Merced. I have torn off all the layers. I have looked straight into the darkness. I have called spirits of the dead. I have let them take my voice, take my body. I have brought back what I have lost and danced here with them, my mother, my sister, the years, hungry and burned. One girl said, he's crying because he can't talk. Another offered, he's crying because he can't dance. In this studio, I have laid down my fears. I have been easily hurt. Snow melts, flowers bloom. There is getting up off the floor, the third pine, the ground, the sky, the space between. This is where I have danced. This is where I leave you from. So um, one of the influences on Basho are is, the, is uh, the Tang Dynasty poets, uh, Li Po and De Fe. And um, I have this next poem is a letter to Li Po. Dear Li Po, a million times I've read your letter. I know what you mean about sadness being the easy way to go in a poem about Americans being spoiled. I can see how you might get that idea. Trust me, a cruise ship isn't a good example. I'm glad you like Melbourne, and I'm sure the Galapagos were amazing. I looked up the pictures on the internet. That's a new kind of library. The cream they put on their skin is to block the sun. They want to stay young looking. A tan doesn't make them less white. It's complicated. Let me just say, the war was a kind of storm. I sat in my kitchen. I wrote sad poems. My dear Joshua joined the army. He loved the uniform. He loved jumping out of planes. He wasn't in the helicopter that crashed. He was part of the crew sent to the wreckage. They found pieces of bodies and cleaned them and put them in groups and sent them home. He survived. We eat at taquerias and see movies about Britain. We plan family trips to the mountains. Spoiled, yes, in many ways. I came only with your poems. I read them the night the train left Oakland. By Portland, I was beginning to doubt the translations. But I kept going. We walked the seawall in Vancouver, and my father said, where are we? Where are we? It's morning here in the middle of the night in China. I keep all your letters. 
I promise I won't sell them at auction. I promise no more sad poems. I'll write about the rain and these mountains and how very young I am and how writing to you is just like talking on the phone. Let's make a plan to drink and hike. We can meet at base camp. I'll bring you a rainproof coat. They sell beer in cans there. Amazing, I know. Um, so one of the things I, I, that's really important to me here in California is the Squaw Valley community of writers, and I've had the great privilege to, to be part of that community. And um, it's, a, it's a week in summer um, where we go up to the mountains and you have to write a poem a day, which is both thrilling and terrifying. And I live in kind of a desperate panic. And um, so this next poem uh, was written there. And it's again in, in conversation with Duffa and Lipo, but they're here magically in California. It's called uh, The Sky of Woo. It's 4 a.m., the bar is closed, and Starbucks isn't opened yet. So they keep talking, Lipo at least. Duffa is shuffling a deck of cards that is missing the ace of spades. Play anyway, Lipo says. Duffa hesitates. Lipo wants to meet Bob Haas, but I don't know his room number, and he's got a poem due tomorrow. <laughs> How about hot chocolate? No dice. Lipo wants the party to start. I have not been displaced by the war, discomforted, maybe. Duffa keeps shuffling. L let's write on a joker and make that an ace, I say. They scowl, novice. I write letters to Joshua in Kandahar. He sends pictures back in uniform in a helicopter, tan with sunglasses, smiling. Duffa smokes an e-cigarette. Li Po is laughing at him. They want to meet Charles Wright, but I don't have his phone number. The night is already over. There's nothing that's going to start except the nature walk and then workshop. We don't write the poems together, I explain. We just talk about them. Li Po rolls his eyes, says, America, it's worse than I thought. <laughs> so I'm going to finish. This will be my last poem. Is that good? Am I keeping track of time? OK. More? OK, I'll take requests. Any requests? Um, Okay, well, I will uh, read, I'll add a couple poems here. I will read, um, I think this is the poem that Bob was talking about in the introduction. Oh, here's the poem. Yeah, okay, I'll read Folk Song Translation. This is from my first book that I wrote in between Sacramento and Tokyo. Folk Song Translation. In Portuguese, they have a specific verb for throwing something out the window. That was after. Right now, I'm making your shadow, tracing your movements, catching the sharp edges of consonants, crossouts, catchphrases, latchkey, house, house key, wearing its shape into the change purse of my wallet. I'm keeping the king key there in case I need to go back, unlock those four summers, the pile of stones, pass my fingers over the braille of incomplete sentences. The fields near your house in Kanamara are a lush, misty green, with mazes of stone walls four feet high, like an outline of city windows. Not walls to make rooms or mark off space, just walls as a place to pile stones. In Japanese, there's one character that means searching for something and a different character that means searching for something that you've lost. I try to imagine farming in those little boxes with no openings for a plow, no doorways, no spaces for coming or going. He's writing us in 500 word news clips. He's typing us in squares across the field. Incredible is the same word in French and English. When you say it in San Francisco, it means unbelievably wonderful. When you say it in 
in Quebec City, it means unbelievably wicked. Letters for me still come to your house. They won't bring me back or let you go. They write out the words, ice flow, glacier, granite, drain pipe, folk song, doorway. Okay, there's one other poem in here we should not skip. Um, so I'm working with, one of the things that I've um, found as really kind of part of the work of poetry has been studying other languages. Um, I went to French school as a child in, on the east coast of Canada, and I've studied Japanese more recently and found that like the character dictionary between English and Japanese was really kind of a poetry source book. Um, and so I have a number of poems that are kind of working with those translations. Um, and so in this poem, I have meanings of different characters in separation, and then the characters together, how they might, what they might mean as a phrase. Um, and I sometimes, there's imagined aspects of a lot of my work, but this poem is a true story. It's called, How to Find a Man Up to the Task. This body is measured in sugar, in days of butter, in soft flour, in honey, in ground sesame. Ki, a container, ryo, a measure, fu, to erase, to take back, to make into nothing. Count me aged and aging, count me calcium and marrow and churned butter, Pound me into the bed springs, into cotton and late night radio, into dulse and kelp and dry leaves. On Barrington Street, handsome, dirt in his nails, with clear, strong eyes holding a cardboard sign. Kirobake. Broke, hungry, the sign reads, will work for food, beer, or money. Kiromakeru, a container, a measure to make into nothing, also means too smart for success, too beautiful for your own good. He sees me watching him and flips over the sign. Quality sperm available, bargain price, everything included. <laughs> So this uh, last poem I'll read, it's a pivots me from, um, it was kind of my entree into this Lipo series that I'm now working on. And it's called uh, Lipo Loves Two Things. We know, right, we know Lipo was kind of this Tang Dynasty poet that was, he lived he, under the, he, people thought he really had the potential to do really well on the service exam. And so, and he kind of claimed to be connected really distantly to an important family. Um, so he lived on this great reputation, but he never actually wrote that exam. Um, and is kind of had this wild poetic personality. Um, and this poem starts as one of the anecdotes that's more famous about his life. So, Lipo loved two things. Lipo loved two things, waterfalls and drinking. When the emperor summoned him, he was drunk in the bar. Lipo wrote back, excuse me from your court today, I am a drunken hermit. <laughs> Worn like these stones, water rushes past me, branches and trunks form dams, those leaning together houses, the fish stalks disappearing, a tree standing still in the flooded creek. I left because there were whole towns without work. Houses worth less than the water heater, fishing hamlets without roads, houses clustered around the docks, docks clustered around the fish houses. We were a generation that shipped out. There are a thousand songs about us, sung by those who stayed. The news says they found growing numbers of cod. 
To me now, the stocks are still down. 20 years dropping and 20 years when not one boat went out. It's not that they're fishing again, it's just that they might. And my laced armed friends, my moose land woods, could we come back? Could they stitch us into the salt air, the wind bent pines, a kitchen table, a mist damp coat, the lingering blue dusk? Are they counting us? If this is the middle path, if I had to fight, if I were called to court, I'd fight with sticks, with ice cold water, with direct sunlight, with reckless wind spun seeds, the outer edge of a kite tail, the fairgrounds, the spinning teacups, if I had to pick two things to love. Lipo looking down over the falls in another country, hundreds of years later, picking flowers. Basho looking down over the falls in another country hundreds of years later, picking flowers for Li Po. Fish don't have ears, but they make love songs to find other fish. Water is 800 times more dense than air. The body of a fish is as dense as water. Fish don't hear sound waves, they absorb them. Thank you very much.